I'm Robert Taylor, and I welcome you to this afternoon's Artist Talk, sponsored by the Art Committee here at Kendall at Oberlin. Let me begin by thanking Phil Pritchett for hosting the Zoom and Bruce Richards for putting it onto Kendall's in-house television channel, KOTV. Our guest today is Stephen Tomasco, whose artworks are now hanging in our Kendall gallery. He'll be sharing some images with us while he talks, after which we'll have some time for him to answer your questions and respond to your comments. As is our custom, we'd like that discussion to be a person-to-person -person conversation, so here's what we'll do. While Stephen is talking, please be sure that those of you who are on Zoom are muted to keep extraneous noises from interrupting his remarks. But then afterward, if you'd like to speak, unmute yourself and ask your question or give your comment. Then please mute yourself again during the response. If someone else begins speaking just ahead of you, please wait for the next opportunity. Those of you watching on TV can't ask questions, of course, but you'll be able to enjoy the discussion anyway. People often ask me where I find the wonderful artists that I bring to the Kendall Gallery. The answer for today is a particularly interesting one. Way back in 2015, soon after I took over as curator for the Kendall Gallery, I stopped into a gallery in Vermilion called Art Scene and discovered a show of photographs of the most gorgeous spring flowers I had ever seen. I was so entranced that I immediately contacted the artist who was of course, Stephen Tomasco, and invited him to show here in the Kendall Gallery the following spring. That show was a huge success. And after it came down, I had the pleasure of visiting Stephen at his studio, which is in the backyard of his home in Bath, Ohio, near Akron. There I took a look at some of the other projects he was working on, including a series of photos of county fairs in Ohio. I loved those too and I decided to schedule him for a second show in 2018, in the fall when those fairs would be popping up in counties all across the state. Then during 2020, when I wasn't able to get out to look for new artists, I decided to, in to invite back some of my favorites. When I thought of Stephen, I knew that I wanted to have some of his photos of flowers in the gallery this spring. At the end of yet another COVID winter, when all of us would be very much needing to have that kind of beauty to enjoy. Okay. I visited Stephen again to see what else he was working on. And we decided to also include his photos of Civil War battlefields, some of his encaustics, and some of his collages. And thus came about the show we are now enjoying. Here to tell you about himself and his work is Stephen Tomasco. Hello. Thank you all for joining us today. Special thanks to Robert and the art committee and all the fine folks uh, there at Kendall at Oberlin that have been so generous uh, with me over the years uh, showing the work. Uh, thanks to Fava as well for the, the website work uh, where the show is also uh, able to be seen and uh, appreciate all the, the hard work that uh, goes into putting that together. So I'm gonna talk to you today uh, you, you, you have work up on the walls that you, you can look at. I'm going to show you a little bit, tell you a little bit more about my history and uh, show you some of the work that came before, uh, that, that uh, the ideas behind that work and what led up to the work that you're seeing today. And also a little bit uh, of the work that, that you have up on the walls. We'll talk about that and also what's coming next. Um, at, at the end, we can touch on that. And uh, I'm hoping to leave plenty of time for your, your questions because I found in the past that uh, your community has the, the best questions. So I'm um, look, looking forward to, to that as well. So I'm gonna do a little screen share here and uh, get it going. Um, does that look, look good on your end? Can you see the... Uh, the PowerPoint uh, slide there. All right. Okay, so um, I started off small, like uh, like all of us, right? A um, little smaller than this, I'm told, but I don't really don't really remember it. Um, 
and had a really wonderful childhood in uh, growing up in Parma, Ohio. I went to college assuming that I was going to do this. Uh, my father was a, a businessman and I grew up paying attention to what he was doing uh, his entire life and was kind of fascinated by it. Um, I had the went to Bowling Green State University um, and started off as a business major and had the wonderful opportunity over three summers to work downtown Cleveland at the National City Bank in an executive training program and had a nice job waiting for me at the end of all that. If I made it through, uh, wanting to do it. But after a couple summers, I felt like this, not quite uh, enthusiastic, feeling a bit of a uh, a bit of a robot in those those situations. And so even before I was given my trench coat and sent off to the trenches to uh, work in the, the business world, I decided to shift gears and chart a different course. And so what would I do? Well, I was fascinated with ideas and I found myself after a couple of years in undergrad business program, not really learning anything. Um, I think most of the business stuff I had picked up over the years from my father or reading the newspaper and that sort of thing. So I was fascinated with ideas and, and looking at things. And so I decided to become a art history and philosophy major at Bowling Green and the world opened up. It was just, fabulous going to classes. And I was just looking forward to everything that I was learning and moved forward with the idea that I would become an art history professor. That seemed like a, a pretty perfect uh, world to, to be part of looking at beautiful things and talking to young students, uh, and introducing them to the exciting world uh, of art. And so in my senior year at Bowling Green, I took a photography class, which as these things go, I thought it was going to be super easy. Uh, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I had learned photography, uh, basically self-taught. I got all the books out of the library, Kodak, how to photograph, how to, that sort of thing. And uh, my father got me a used Argus C3 camera from one of his uh, colleagues at work. And I, without a light meter or anything, taught myself how to photograph and set about making images uh, that were similar to all those in the, the pretty Kodak books and that sort of thing. And by the time I was 12, 13 years old, I felt like I had done everything. Now I find myself in this class, brilliant young professor straight out of Yale, uh, tells me about what had been done in photography in the art world and what was being done and sort of led to what could still be done. And I would take this class. This is the first photo that I made that, that sort of hinted at something greater. This was uh, up at, in Detroit at the Detroit Jazz Festival uh, in that class. And so this revelation, this punch in the face, this change of course um, and I decided to pursue fine art instead of talking about artists. I decided to pursue the making of art. And I took time off uh, from after I graduated, uh, took a year off to build a portfolio and teach myself more about photography. Uh, during that time, I supported myself as a photographer as well. This. Um, I taught continuing education at Bowling Green um, at, the, at the university uh, in the photography department. And I also taught individuals and worked with uh, people. I ran across the uh, fellow who had the finest hair salon in Toledo, Ohio, and he wanted me to teach him how to use his new camera and photograph uh, some models that he worked with. And, make images for him to submit to these glossy hair magazines that you would have in the salon. And so 
being young and energetic and not even knowing what I'm doing. And I said, of course, I said yes. And I set out over that year and had the opportunity to make some wonderful images and, and meet some people. And um, during the same time, I also had a wonderful opportunity to fly around the country uh, employed as a photographer for a group of companies, uh, primarily in heavy industry, steel and automotive. And so I got a chances to see things like this, this giant forge in, um, in Texas uh, with a chunk of molten steel there and steel rolling through galvanizing tank, the shimmering uh, wall of metal and wonderful places that were just beyond imagination. This is a blast furnace in Gadsden, Alabama. This bridge, this lovely little idyllic seeming bridge over this horrid you know, river of molten steel. Uh, this room filled with people in the, their tinfoil suits uh, to keep from melting down. And so I was just exposed to this, you know, crazy cool America um, in, in so many ways. And it informed the work that I was making and the work that I wanted to do when I went to graduate school to tell something about these American tales. And so I ended up going to the University of Delaware, Newark, Delaware, which was a pretty fabulous place to go. It positioned two hours away from New York, 45 minutes from Philly, one hour from Baltimore and two hours down to DC. Every weekend I was looking at art and going to amazing places and photographing um, kind of America and American life. Um, this is Longwood Gardens outside of uh, Philadelphia, one of the DuPont estates and these amazing formal gardens. This is the first place that I started really looking at gardens to photograph and the, in this case, the formal landscape of, of these beautiful gardens. It was truly eye-opening. And places like the Jersey Shore where you found these weird bits of things thrown together in such an interesting way. They also hosted the Miss America parade every fall. And so I'd go and see that. And it was really this fabulous bit of, of Americana. My father's family was from central Pennsylvania and I'd grown up going there in the summer times. And so I wasn't far from there. And so I would return to those areas. This is a, a, a sort of shrine to American motherhood in central PA. And wonderful shimmery bits of ice and ice skating and Rockefeller Center and all these amazing places. And this is work that I made in, in graduate school. I also along the way met my amazing wife here in uh, at University of Delaware. She was the smartest and kindest person I'd ever met and continues to, to be such. And um, we've had some wonderful uh, adventures along the way, making life a bit magic. So um, I'm always trying to find, and I, I realized what I was looking for was, was images with, with some depth to them, not necessarily easy stories uh, or straightforward stories, but, but images which suggest something. Um, perhaps I set the stage somehow and I want you to bring more to, to the image, um, your, your memories, your thoughts. And so I'm looking for bits of magic like this guy in Central Park or bits of celebration like this cake on Madison Avenue. Looking for stories. I'm looking for what it felt like to be alive. These beautiful moments and exciting moments and scary moments. What it feels like to be stuck in a crowd, in this case with that 
light that just always comes down Fifth Avenue in New York City in the middle of the winter. It's an amazing thing. What does it feel like to be in love? What is it like to find home, to be family, to set out in America, and ride off into the sunset, looking perhaps for our own little slice of paradise. Trying to find little moments of beauty in otherwise normal America. And I keep coming back, these little themes that you're seeing come back over and over again, even to this day. So this is way back in you know, 1990, I'm looking at these little flowering trees in the landscape. America and our amazing clash of cultures. Little stories, little bits of encouragement the mother, one of the Miss America candidates. A place to call home. This is the homestead uh, in Portage, Pennsylvania, my, my father's family. These little bits of Eden that people create for themselves. And then life comes along, you know, and we make these images. So, you know, when I made this one with the World Trade Center in the background, I loved it and I felt like it was kind of loaded with a lot of thoughts and feelings and that sort of thing. Um, and of course, you know, years later, it, it means something more, something different. If you've noticed my show, you'll see that I don't really title work. I usually just list the series that it's from. Um, but in my head, I always think of this one as Shoot the Messenger. So I want to take you along for the ride. And myself. I mean, for me, making a photograph is always something new. Do, does it feel like? Does it take me on the ride? Does it excite me when I see it? Is it something new? And that's always the test for me. I, I never will put an image out that feels like one that I've seen before or one that I've made before. It's always that challenge to make something new, something that excites me and, you know, some of the artist friends that I have. And it's always about growing up and being in a place and bits of our history. And as I, went, as I got older, this sense of history and how we teach it and, and how it filters through our cultures become more and more important. Like this image going back with the you know, little kid dressed up as a Civil War general or soldier. Interested in ways we see ourselves and how that can change this, this outside, of, um, outside of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And bits of complicated uh, the, our, our history. So this is Strom Thurmond. And this year, uh, Marjorie Vincent was the Miss America. And so Strom Thurmond, you know, 48 years as a senator, retires at 100 years old in 2003. And here he is, you know, with one of the first Black Miss Americas outside um, along the, the boardwalk in uh, Atlantic City. It's a lot of complicated things. And so life changes again. So in 96, my daughter, Alex, is born. And we get the opportunity to move to back to Ohio, uh, which is the perfect time to grow up in this case, who's getting a kiss there from her cousin and uh, grandparents and all that sort of thing. So uh, we take that opportunity, but, uh, and, and I also have the opportunity to be the at-home dad. So uh, my wife uh, wanted to, to keep working and she's best at, uh, at what she does and, and has, has a, a great job. And so I got the chance to, to be home and do the day-to-day -day with my daughter and it was a fantastic time. 
I didn't make much in the way of art for a little while. And then I, when I started, I wasn't doing much photography except for perhaps uh, in this case, you see Chuck E. Cheese. They had a little machine in there that would make these little photo drawings. Uh, I kind of have a little group of them and, and they're, they're pretty fun. But um, it, it was kind of the extent of what I did for a little while, photo wise. Instead, I found myself, I was making drawings uh, at the time and especially of these little saplings as they would at about this time of year come out, uh, start to leaf out. And so if I'd get a day like this where the, the snow would fall, I'd run out and make some images like this of these little saplings against the snow so I could really see what they looked like. And when that wasn't available, I would run around. I don't know if you can tell from the image, but this is a a white shower curtain. So I'd go out in the parks and I'd have this little shower curtain and I'd throw them down on the ground and photograph these little saplings uh, against the white backdrop. I'm sure I looked quite insane, but uh, you know, we're uh, as an artist, you, you kind of get used to that. So find something like this, this beautiful little tulip tree just leafed out. And so I would use these photographs as source material for drawings. Um, this is a little notebook sketch. Some of them, like this one, I would make in the field and some I would make later um, using the photographs that I had made. And I really enjoyed making them. And, and they, I think some of those drawings are, are quite successful. At the same time, I had this little camera. It was just a little point and shoot that I was making those previous shots that you just saw. Uh, and I was using that to, you know, just resource material for the rest of the year. But at the time the, these trees were leafing out, you also, as you know, right about now, we're starting to get the little star magnolias. Uh, there was a couple star magnolia trees at, at Nature Realm here, uh, not too far from, from where I live in, uh, in Bath and in Fairlawn. And I started using my, this little point and shoot that I had around these flowering trees, not thinking that I was making art, but just that it was kind of fun. I would pop out the flash and cover up part of it and see what would happen if I went really close or if I used the flash in a certain way. And I made these photographs and I just had cheap little prints made, just like little machine prints from, from Walmart or Walgreens or something. But I tacked them up on the studio wall and an odd thing happened. Just about everyone who came into the studio said the same thing when they went over to look at the photos. And it would always be something like, it smells like flowers in here. And when you hear that, having taught art and art history and uh, photography, you're always trying to encourage artists to evoke the senses and, and get experience uh, like that, people to, to respond in, in such a way. And so I, after I heard that a number of times, I thought, well, I better get serious about this. And so for the following spring, I did my research and homework. And this was just about the time, just like, 2007, 2008, when, in my opinion, digital cameras were getting good enough to make serious work with. And so I needed a specific camera for this job. I needed a camera that was both light and high quality uh, because I would be using it, holding the camera in one hand and holding a flash in the other hand. So these images, all the ones that you see in the show, uh, down in the hallway and at the gallery and all the ones that I'm going to show you here, all of them are lit artificially and in most cases naturally as well. So striking a balance to create a very theatrical image. Uh, and so I was interested in, in creating this drama where the flowers became the, the characters, the actors and the the, the scenery became the set, and there was some bit of, of, of drama, of, of smell of flowers, of, 
of feeling of what it's like to be there. And I pushed it. I pushed the boundaries. I, you know, how pink is too pink? You know, how much blur can you put in an image? How do we create an image that will draw us in? Not only me, because I was there, I knew what a wonderful day it was, but you and all the other viewers so that you would be drawn into the scene and bring along with you your experience and your stories. And so these round out to become an experience, not just a document, but convey a feeling And so I would photograph during the day, and during the night. And I found that it didn't have to be a gorgeous, sunny day. It could be a rainy day or a dark day. And I just fell in love with these gardens in Northeast Ohio, primarily, although I've traveled the States and really just some great gardens all around the country as part of the project. And so as I went along, I was able to build a studio uh, in, in the back, uh, the back yard of my house. Um, I think this is Robert had mentioned he had come by to visit. So here's a little peek into what he saw. It's back in the woods, um, has a bit of a tree house feel to it. You can see here uh, some work photos up on the wall in the editing stage and on the floor, some encaustic paintings. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty great place to do some work. I also had a chance to publish this work uh, as a book. It's called Deliria Naxira. It was published by Shanti Arts uh, out of Maine. And uh, that was a, a very interesting project and really focuses you on, on what the project is about and, and how to convey and tell the story in, in a book form. And so I continued as well uh, to uh, make those drawings. As, as you saw in the notebook a little while ago. And those drawings then eventually also became encaustic paintings. So here you see uh, one of the first shows. Uh, this, is, this is actually from that show, Robert, that you mentioned uh, at the art scene in, uh, in, in Vermilion, uh, where I first showed this work all together, uh, the encaustics, the drawings, and uh, the photographs. And so the beauty of encaustic is that you can uh, manipulate both color and create sur surface and texture. And uh, also that, that wonderful, just working with the wax, the smell of the wax and the way that relates to the, the natural world. I was really lucky when I was at the University of Delaware, I got to take classes in the, they have a world-class uh, art um, uh, conservation program. And I was able to take classes in the art conservation program while I was uh, um, working on my MFA. And I got a chance to learn all these historic techniques. So I got to learn how to do frescoes like Michelangelo or egg tempera like Jado did, or in this case, encaustic, which is a historic technique dating back to the ancient Egyptians. They created this, um, some of the most famous examples are called the Fayum portraits. You can find them in many major museums. And they're these wonderful, this glowing portrait pieces uh, painted on wood that were actually meant to uh, cover the face of the, the mummies uh, that they would wrap to memorialize the, the person. Um, and I learned how to, how to do that when I was there and continued that uh, to use those skills in this, this project. And so I found that this all worked together, this, the very over the top color photographs, the spare drawings, uh, the encaustics, uh, 
were kind of two sides of the same coin and that they really rounded out the experience uh, for me. And I love showing this work kind of all together um, in, in a way where you can see many, many examples together, like at the, the Kendall Gallery. And so now I'd move to digital, right? It's kind of like the moment, if you noticed, where it was all black and white, and, and now we've jumped to color. When I made that switch from, uh, from film to digital, which was crucial to photograph those flowers um, in order, I just need that instant feedback uh, that the digital camera gives me in photographing um, the, the, the flower scenes. But now I had a digital camera that was good enough and my mind was now working in color instead of black and white. And so I started looking at other things. And as, as Robert mentioned, county fairs uh, became uh, and, and still are somewhat of an obsession for me to, to go and photograph, um, finding all of these amazing things like plates full of white bread in the white bread competition. And, just photography gives you such wonderful things. Like you couldn't have picked a, a, a better name for the, the winner of the white bread competition than Vicki Columbus, I think in Medina, Ohio. Or perhaps my favorite category ever for the, the county fairs, plate of racks, plate of farm racks. Um, and you'll see a whole bunch of these plates of farm racks. They all look about exactly the same. Uh, but, but this one won first place. Hardin County, that's the only one I know. You might want to think about going to the fair uh, just, just to catch the, uh, the, the farm rock category this summer. I found all these amazing characters um, out there, wonderful people, you know, these children doing their best, uh, raising these animals and, and showing these animals growing up, finding their place in the world, dealing with others uh, in these settings. It's fascinating to look at and, and a wonderful opportunity to photograph. This is at the Ohio State Fair. Being judged, putting yourself out in the world by your peers, by elders, these little views into the family life, you know, generations uh, grown up on the farm and passing along the history and the tradition. And at the fair is the, the sense of history there. So the, the carnies, the traveling shows, big, really how some of my biggest supporters at the fairs because they're very tied up with, with keeping this history going, the, this tradition alive. This guy's looking a little bit uh, worried because the guy in the back, I don't know if you can catch a little, little edge there. He's got an apple in one hand and a chainsaw on the other hand. And he's gonna put that apple in this guy's mouth and carve his initial in the apple. This is a, a great, great bit from the traveling uh, shows. And Spidora, part of a magic uh, act. Summer's end, fall comes along and I was looking for a new challenge and I started photographing uh, the amazing vehicles and people and community that forms outside of Cleveland Brown Stadium and the sort of famous Muni lots. This is one of my other ongoing long-term projects. These sort of characters that show up there and do things. And I don't know what's going on a lot of the time, perhaps neither do the cops, but uh, it's fascinating to see what, what happens and create my own photographic stories there. And I've been doing this now for 10 seasons. Yes, he jumps off of this building and some people who didn't know each other two minutes before link arms and, and catch him. <laughs> or hot dog cannons.
So I'm always looking. I'm always paying attention and, and being open in the world. My daughter, five years ago, is applying to, to medical school. Yeah, they grow up that fast. And uh, she had interviews all around the country. And I, I had the opportunity to get a chance to, to drive her to many of these um, these interviews. And I found myself in amazing places. In this case, I'm in Lynchburg, Virginia, in the old city cemetery walking around. And I find myself in the middle of a cemetery that's mostly made up of poor, the pauper, slave um, cemetery. In the middle is this Confederate patch, which seems so crazy out of place. And I start thinking, how did it get here? And how did how did I get here? And how did the country get here? And it just seemed like a, a really loaded and interesting road uh, to, to think about. And I started looking at these stones. And with just a couple minutes left before I needed to pick up my daughter, I came up with, with how I wanted and, and, and how I could photograph this in an interesting way, which was to look at these stones and to, to cut out almost everything except for a little bit of border to place them in space and create these sort of abstract images which somehow felt loaded with with what had gone before and and the history since and so excited by that possibility I set out and, and on these these interview trips throughout the country I started looking for bits of American history um, and, and places that were loaded with the same imports. Uh, this is Dill Cemetery in Pikeville, Kentucky, which is the re final resting place for many of both the Hatfield and McCoy clan. So after all of that, you know, they end up in the same cemetery, not far from each other. And so the same with the, the Civil War in a lot of cases where you have Union and Confederate buried oftentimes even side by side in cemeteries. This is a cemetery in New Orleans. And I looked at these places where the battles took place. Uh, this is Fort Morgan out in like kind of Biloxi Bay in, in Alabama um, along the Gulf. It's the hottest day I've ever photographed. It was 103 degrees. But I found these amazing remnants and, and surfaces that remained of this place and from that time. And uh, so it all became part of this project, which I call civil um, moving forward. And I found myself in amazing battlefields like Shiloh, uh, one, of the, one of the, I would say most powerful battlefields um, that I've been to. I've been to 15 states and over 250 battlefields, sites, and uh, cemeteries related to, to the Civil War uh, over these past five years as part of this project. And it's complicated, like everything, right? So here we've got um, the battlefield in Shiloh and Many soldiers buried on the battlefield as they fell, they needed to do something. And so that area underneath the sign between the cannonballs, that is a, a trench which is still um, full of uh, soldiers from, from the battle. Um, many of the Union soldiers have been moved to the National Cemetery also on the battlefield. Many of the Confederates specifically remain in those trenches. Um, and as a photographer, amazing things happen. Just as I'm explaining this to my nephew, who is on this trip with me, he's provided much of the heavy lifting historically for me. He, at the time, was in high school, uh, now is in, uh, at Notre Dame, has been there for a couple of years, a uh, few years, and he specifically studies history, specifically the Civil War. And uh, he's, he's provided me with a great background and a travel companion on many of these trips. But as we were photographing uh, these burial trenches in Shiloh, I hear this tremendous roar of these 
Harley cycles coming in and I say to him, should we stick around and see what's going on or we better jump in our car and go if we're going to go? And he said, let's see. So we found out it was a group of, uh, of people who traveled up from Mississippi, uh, specifically looking at the same things we were. They were, they were, it was a fundraising trip to raise money to buy flowers, uh, artificial flowers to put on the graves of the fallen uh, over the, the course of the winter when you're allowed to do it. And of course, being from Mississippi, they were telling a different story than, than I was, the different tradition. Um, but it was fascinating to hear their side and their emotion being from there, it seemed so alive, the, the, the battle, almost as if the battle had just taken place. Um, and uh, it was clear how raw this is in America, these, these issues um, and, and, and how rich and complicated the story is. And so I photographed them and I photographed the battlefield. And it was these cannonballs that marked where the fallen were still on the battlefield that ended up making the deepest impression on me. And I went back a few times now here. So I photographed these over multiple days and multiple times of day. And just looking at these stones. And for me, it struck me, uh, or looking at these, the, these, these metal cannonballs, what, what struck me most was the way they resembled planets or galaxies and struck for me, you know, what could have been if it wasn't for, you know, the horrors of war and the hate that led to that and all that could have been if not for, you know, people falling in battle, history going forward, history going backwards. And so, yeah, in resembling planets and, and galaxies, they meant so much more than just a, a hunk of metal. And so I continued to work and make those images. I also started looking, I was looking at these places and specifically at, at the stones that were um, there then and continue to be there now and trying to feel what those stones could tell us. In this case, we have the Devil's Den at, uh, at Gettysburg. So I went to Gettysburg a number of times now, and uh, it's hard to find a time when you can go and get to the battlefield at night. I really love it at night, but the, the hours are, are very limited. So uh, on current trips, I've tried to go at the, around the uh, the shortest days of the year where actually the hours of the park uh, overlap with with some time before dawn and, and after dusk. So these images that you're looking at of the stones and that you have in the hallway gallery, those um, those were all made at night. <coughs> Excuse me. And I lit them. So I, I have battery operated lights that I brought into the into the battlefield. And of course, like everything else, the times have been complicated um, with the you know, protests uh, over Confederacy. Um, many of the places I used to go have even been closed off or limited access. This one struck me in a sort of funny way. In, in, in it's very Southern. We are truly sorry, but due to the, quote, recent unpleasantness, we find it necessary to lock these gates. Um, just how recent the unpleasantness is, uh, that, that seems up for, up for question. And I was excited to find that, though this all seemed very personal to me, um, I found some really great uh, outlets for this work. Um, so this is a show that was uh, earlier last year at the Mansfield Art Center, which if you're traveling that way is a, a gorgeous space beautiful uh, architect uh, design space that had the, the, one of the first big exhibitions of, of the civil work. 
and so going forward, so what's next, right? So I'm always, always working on something. Uh, in photography, I'd been collecting these um, uh, along my travels and, and over time collecting up these little figurines. And some of them really struck me as, you know, bits of, of our history, bits of America. In fact, many of them that I, that I buy uh, are stamped made in occupied Japan. They were made uh, by American companies in Japan to rebuild industry after, after the Second World War. And, um, you know, many of them are Southern bells or Southern gentlemen. And I became sort of fascinated of, of what that meant. You know, why, why would we make these, these figures sort of um, uh, about that? And, and what does it mean? And so I've started to match these figures uh, this was during the, the whole lockdown, uh, was matching up these figures with my photographs as backdrops. And so in a case like this, you have the figure in the foreground and one of my photographs as background. And I, I light them, <coughs> excuse me, light them and um, create a new image, which I photograph and then, and then print. And so we have uh, the, this new series called Historic Figures. <clears throat> I apologize about the voice. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little hoarse at the moment, but uh, you know, we don't talk that much during, uh, <laughs> during the lockdown. But so this project is ongoing, uh, still matching these figures with the the bits of American history as background, kind of seeing what what can uh, what can take place when I when I mix and match them, and uh, it's a way to photograph figures without photographing people during the uh, these weird uh, lockdown times. So that's about it, I think, for my uh, my talk here. I'm just going to try to get out. Okay. Let's see. How do I get back to my... You seem to be back home. Yeah. All right, I'm back here. Can you see, can you pop back? Do I need to do something to pop back so you can see me again? Uh, you, you we, we saw you before and then you, before that image came back up. So do whatever you did before. Take that away. Okay, let's. There, All right. you are. Great. There you are. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. We. Not only do we know your, your work, we know you. Now, that was really, really great. Um, Thank you. And now, are there questions from those of you on Zoom who would like to ask or, or say something to Stephen? Just, yeah, go ahead, thanks. <laughs> Anybody, just unmute and talk. Mary has her hand up. Okay. Hi, Mary. Unmute, unmute Mary Hi. and say what you want to say. I, I have unmuted. Um, Stephen, so much of your early work was in black and white, which I found very intriguing as much as I am enthralled by your beautiful color photographs that are on display of the photos of the flowers. And then these very striking atmospheric ones of the battlefields and the Balls, what are you still doing black and white work? Are you continuing to sort of shift your emphasis to different areas as well as continuing with the beautifully lit flowers? So yeah, all these projects tend to, tend to continue. Uh, most of the work I do these days is color. I've not uh, given up black and white entirely. Uh, there are certain images that work very well with black and white. I had the chance last summer to learn from one of the, the best out there how to do some 
historical black and white techniques. So I learned how to do uh, palladium printing, which is very historic uh, way of uh, coating paper and, and making uh, very long lasting, very beautiful black and white images. And some of these civil war images work particularly well uh, with that technique. And so that, that work, I um, haven't had a chance to show it yet, but uh, hopefully that work will start to get out in the world and I'll do more of that as well. But I, I just sort of let each subject matter kind of dictate uh, the, the approach that I take. But um, yeah, large, largely working color and uh, with the digital work these days. Um, but, but yeah, black and white is not off the table, that's for sure. Do you print your own or do you have them printed? The prints are just exquisite. So the, I always print my own work uh, with the exception of very large prints. Uh, for example, Suma Hospital just purchased two uh, 52 inch wide prints to go in their, their new, uh, one of their new facilities here in Akron, uh, the Akron area. And that's too large for me to deal with. So I have um, a friend of mine who's, a world-class printer uh, at that size because there's there's certain skills involved once you get super large like that but anything you know two feet wide or or less I deal with in, in the studio and it's important for me to have control like that um, before I decided I could do digital uh, work uh, I I knew exactly the way I wanted the, the images to look on paper. I wanted them to resemble, actually, I wanted them to resemble Japanese woodcuts. Uh, my, my early, um, my, the photographs from nature. And so I did a whole bunch of experimenting, finding just the right paper and just the right printer that would make images which would come out uh, as digital images exactly the way I wanted them to look. So. Um, yeah, so I take pride in, in the printing and I'm, I'm sort of very careful about how that, how that works. Could you talk about the process of the encaustics? A lot of people have asked about how that happens. Yeah, so it's, it's a pretty fascinating process. Um, in some ways, really easy. In other ways, kind of terrifying because it can go bad very quickly. Um, so the, the process is... Uh, that the medium that you're using is pure beeswax. Uh, in some cases, a little bit of Damar resin um, uh, might be added to that, but uh, primarily it's, it's beeswax. And like any painting medium, uh, then you would suspend pigment, uh, which is pure ground pigment. Um, within your, your media. And, and so in this case, you get the mat wax in a molten state. So I use like heating plates with um, actually uh, muffin tins <laughs> works pretty well. And uh, so you'd have one muffin tin for each of your major colors that you're using on your heating plates. And you get that in, in a molten state and you can apply that with natural bristle brushes or palette knives or pour it on or do whatever you want. So it goes on and of course it instantly or very quickly cools, um, in which case it's, it's somewhat set. And then you can go back in with, uh, with tools to scrape it or move it around. You can remelt it and, and, and move it. Um, and then when you have it just about where you want it, then you need to set it with a final heat. Uh, and I use a, an old, a tool that was used to melt paint off of buildings or, or uh, paint remover. Um, and so that's a scary step because you got to get it hot enough to set it in place. And if you go too far, everything just rolls away. <laughs> um, but if you've done your job correctly and, and set it, it's tremendously permanent. So those Fayum portraits that you see, you go to the Met or other museums and go look at those portrait paintings that were made 2000 years ago. 
it looks, they look like they could have been made today. They're, they're very fresh. The colors are very vibrant. The surfaces, um, they, they glow, uh, probably age better than any other media uh, as far as um, longevity. And, uh, and you always do it on a solid support. So the ones in the show, those are all solid cherry panel. If you were to put it on paper or fabric, um, it, you know, with the flexing, the wax would probably crack off over time. So that's just a, a little technical bit there. Anyone else? Another I question? Was curious. Uh, George. George, yeah. I was curious about the palladium uh, uh, process. Um, what what uh, is it just like a normal normal uh, developing process or or are there special steps you have to take with that so so with uh, it's it's a you 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 make the mixture uh, of, of of the the chemistry um, and immediately then you paint that onto a, a your your piece of paper that you're going to print onto. Uh, allow a little bit of time for that to uh, to set up, and then the process is is a contact print. So you need to create a digital negative or a traditional negative of the size of the finished uh, print, and so you would take that and sandwich that with your paper um, with the gla glass on top and, and lock that together. And then you can uh, expose that to light. Uh, that could be outside or um, in a, a specially made um, exposure box is, is more repeatable. And then it's very similar to a traditional, you know, black and white type thing that you could take it into a, a dark room under safe light kind of situation and process it through some, some chemical steps mm -hmm. and, uh, and dry it. But uh, being, the palladium, uh, platinum, um, the, there it's, it's very, what, if you've done your, your steps and treated your paper properly and everything, it's, it's a very, very permanent, um, pro, uh, right. product yeah. then. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Someone else? Linda Grashoff, who loves photographing surfaces. She is good at surfaces. I've seen some of those. <laughs> no. Well, we thank you so very much. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. It's a wonderful show. We can't thank you enough. And uh, we really appreciate your being with us again. Uh, I'd like to mention again uh, what Stephen said earlier. The, the show is now up on the FAWA website uh, with the help of Tears a Leg, who's absolutely fabulous at doing this. So you just go to favagallery.org, click on exhibitions, and there it is. Oh, and there is Linda. Have you something? <laughs> I was <laughs> muted before. Uh, I yeah. see. Your um, cannonball surfaces. Um, yeah, they definitely speak to me. And some other people here said, Linda, you have to see those cannonballs. <laughs> <laughs> I nice. can believe that. You're, you're, you are the master of surfaces. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's very nice to hear that from you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much, Stephen. We really appreciate it. And thank you so afternoon. much. As bye always, bye. great audience. Bye-bye.